Colossians 1, beginning in the ninth verse. You know, it'd be great to be a part of a church that is so diverse as village. I mean, think about the diversity. At the early service, we were packed full of, of, you know, of snowbirds. Now, there's quite a few snowbirds in this worship service as well, but 9 o'clock is really, you know, it's like the snowbird gathering. It's kind of like the seagulls, you know, out beside one of the restaurants. They all bust in here together. I guess the rest of y'all are just pelicans. You're going to show up when you can't, when you want. But it's good to be together as a church. The diversity, and I was just looking, you know, uh, I appreciate John back on bongos. He was out for a while with a little heart thing that happened at Christmas, but God provided with Alston, and what a blessing he is, and, you know, all the music. And then I was just thinking, you know, about, well, our student ministry, and, you know, how, how our student ministry is going. And, you know, student ministries, they're going to a centrifuge in Greenville, South Carolina this summer. So if you've got a kid... They didn't bring home the postcard. You know, right now is the time to punch them and get with uh, Pastor Sean and get them signed up for Centrifuge in Greenville. And, and I, you know, we've got mission trips coming up. We're going back to North Africa, going to the Dominican Republic. We've got remodeling going on in the children's department. It has begun. If anybody's been up there this weekend, you've seen that. And um, we're still collecting offering for that to help pay for it. Uh, so if you've got a checkbook and you would like to write a check right now, we will gladly receive it. If you don't want to do it in this very second, uh, you can always drop it at the Welcome Center or myself or any of the pastors, and we'll get into the safe this afternoon. I don't know where I was going with all that. But y'all are a great group. You really are. And our deacons, what a mess. Really, they're, they're good. And all the support staff and the preschool staff and all the things that go on. But you know what makes, a, a, you know really what makes us great? It's the fact that we are followers of Jesus Christ. And as followers of Jesus Christ, the Bible gives us words about Christ. And, and we've talked about the mind of Christ. We've talked about the peace of Christ. We've talked about the reward of Christ. And this morning, as we wrap up this series on living secrets, the foundation for living a, 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 an exaggerated Christian life, I want to talk to you about this subject that is preeminence. Now, the word preeminent, if you look it up in the dictionary, this is what you discover. You discover that it is an adjective. And it's this, an adjective is descriptive. Y'all remember that from English? And, and as a descriptive, it means that it, it, it surpasses all others. It doesn't say that it surpasses some others or most others, but it says all others. And so when we read in the Scripture in Colossians 1, verse 18, that the Lord Jesus in everything, He might be preeminent, that means that He is first place, He surpasses all others in every area whatsoever. Now that's a tough, that's a tough thing to feel. Because, you know, it's, it's good to see people that are good at some things. But not everybody's good at everything. Have you ever noticed that? But Jesus Christ is not just good. He surpasses in all things. Now, you also have to back up and understand to whom this letter was being written. It was being written to the people of Colossae. And what was going on in Colossae is they had uh, these people that were mixing what we call Gnosticism and Judaism together, and then you had the opposite sides even in that and all that kind of stuff. And so there was a heresy going on. Now, I had a class way back uh, when in seminary. It was called Spiritual Foundations for Ministry. And I remember Col Colossians so vividly because we came up with this little saying to remember what was going on in Colossae. Woe is me, woe is me, heresy and colossy. 
So you see, you get that down, you always remember there's a heresy going on. Now, what is Gnosticism? I mean, you know, it's kind of a big theological sounding kind of a word, but it, it, it simply says that I've got <coughs> a spiritual, special, inner, higher knowledge than you. I know something that most other people don't know. I've got an intuition that comes from God. Oh, you won't find it here because God has specially revealed it to me. And then you had this thing of Judaism going on. And, and in Judaism, you had the element of, of legalism happening. Has anybody ever been a part of legalism in your life? You know, we, we've had legalism, certainly. You know, I grew up in a home, and as most of us did, but my dad didn't allow playing cards in the house because you could gamble with those. We also didn't have games that had dice in them because you could gamble with those. We had Candyland and Old Maid. <laughs> but, you know, my, my dad came out of that tradition, a great Christian man, but, but he had that. And some of you grew up that way, right? You know, I'm not talking something that's foreign. But also in legalism, we say, well, you know, to be a good Christian, you've got to dress a certain way. You've got to carry a certain kind of Bible. I mean, there's a whole group of uh, people over in Pensacola that believe that, that God spoke in the King James only. Y'all don't find that funny? It's not just Pensacola, but there's a... Uh, I mean, that's the center of a foundation there. Jesus spoke in King James English in 1605. Thank you. But we, you, you see how we add legalism into things? And, 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 and so we have these expectations. And legalistically, we want to look at one another and size one another up as to whether or not we really fit in the Christian life and where we sit in the Christian life based upon a legalistic view. Or we try to do it from a Gnostic view that, oh, well, I've got, a, I've got an intuitive inner knowledge that God's given me and nobody else. And, and we put on this act. And these ideas play out today, uh, you know, uh, in intellectualism and in spiritualism. And, and, you know, we have to have an answer in the church. And the answer is only one response. And that one response is the preeminence of Jesus Christ, that in all things He might be preeminent. To be preeminent means that He is above and He surpasses all other things. So Paul speaks to three areas in which Jesus is preeminent. First of all, he says, biblically, He surpasses all other things. Biblically, Jesus Christ is preeminent. In verse 18, that in everything He might be preeminent, you know, what we gather right here is if I have the wrong view of who Jesus Christ is, the reality of Christ, I will have a wrong view of everything else. If he's just a great man, my, my, my historical thinking is more than messed up and my actual living is messed up. So to have the wrong view of who Jesus Christ is is to, is to mess up everything else because Jesus Christ is the full and the final revelation of God the Father. In other words, Jesus came to earth to show us the Father, right? He, he's God in the flesh. The Bible, as we'll get into it in a moment, in Him the fullness of, of deity dwells. And so he is uh, the full and final revelation of God the Father as revealed here in the Word of God. You know, God's not going to speak to you through another word. He's going to speak to you through His Word. If you have some intuition going on in your life that God's speaking, His speaking will always be backed up by the Scripture. And it won't be a proof text of one verse. It'll be backed up by the whole of Scripture. If God speaks to you through other people, which He does, the church, it'll be backed up through the Scripture. Everything comes back to the Scripture. So the Scripture is of supreme importance. 
But Jesus Christ is even superior to, to all other things. And, and, and so when I begin to look at that, I discover that he's the center of, the, of creation. In verses 15 and 17, the Bible says he is the image of the invisible God. He's the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So Jesus Christ is the eternal image of the invisible God. And as the Lord Jesus is, uh, we find that he is the creator and he's the chief conservationist of the universe. You know, I, I, I bump into people that call themselves conservationists. As a matter of fact, uh, there's just a golf tournament um, that was sponsored by Waste Management. Right? What's the name of that tournament? The Phoenix Open. And did you know that the Phoenix Open leaves a zero carbon footprint? In other words, everything's recycled. Uh, their, their electricity comes from solar power. They leave a zero carbon footprint. They are conservation-minded, right? But Jesus Christ surpasses even waste management. He is the conserver of the universe. Because of who He is, the sun burns continuously. The stars shine in the night. The moon revolves around the earth, and the earth revolves around the sun. And, and there's multitudes and multitudes of planets and stars uh, out uh, in this universe. Jesus Christ created all of that. And so the Bible says, In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, He created them. And so the entire universe is held together by Christ. As a matter of fact, they tell us that there's a protein in everything called laminin. Now, I don't do the job on this that Louis Giglio does in talking about it, but I would encourage you to go before the game, you know, while you're waiting on your wings this afternoon, Google up Louis Giglio and, and, and you'll certainly come across his video called laminin. I mean, it's a really powerful preaching that he does right there. But this, this laminin, I've looked it up. I've seen the microscopic image. The image of laminin, when you look at it, it's in the shape of the cross. It's at the cross that the universe holds together. And the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, is the center of creation. He is also the head of the church. As in Him all things hold together. Lord Jesus Christ is the first man who was ever raised from the dead. And Christ has become the head of redeemed humanity. And He openly declared His Lordship over all of created beings. He's the head of redeemed humanity in the sense that He's the head of the church. And you know, we all need a head, right? Right? I mean, our heads on our bodies are pretty doggone important because your head tells your body what to do. Right? Yes. Your head tells your body what to do. And men, those of you that are married, your wife has a bigger head than you do. And so she tells you what to do. Amen? Come on, that ought to get a response. But we have an even greater head over us as, a, as, as those who are redeemed humanity, as those who make up the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus is our head. And in Ephesians 3, 9, and 11, the Bible says, To bring light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to rulers, authorities, and, princip and heavenly uh, uh, principalities in heavenly places. Do you realize that you, as a child of God, as a part of His church, now I'm not talking about being a member of a village or a member of the Methodists or a member of whatever. I'm talking about the church. Understand, when we get to heaven, the Baptist and the Methodist aren't going to be on opposite corners of the street. Right? The church. 
as God works in you, and as Christ Jesus is magnified over you, having surpassing value over you and all that you are, we are putting on display the manifold grace of Almighty God to all the heavenlies and to all mankind to bring glory and honor unto Him. And as the Redeemer and the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of love. You don't know how to love till He becomes the, the Lord in your life. And because of who He is, the Bible tells us in the book of Philippians, Therefore God has highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him a name, that at the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, that every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is who? Lord. He's Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, it may blow your minds, and we're going to get into this a little bit more because next week I'm beginning a new series that leads us right up to Easter and we're going to be talking about the cross of Jesus Christ. And, and this is really exciting. And next week we're going to look at the, the word of the cross. And we're going to be focused on the cross. But when you really dig in, now this blows your minds. I mean, you've grown up in, in church your whole life. And many of you have been Baptist. And many of you have been Pentecostal. And many of you have been Methodist, whatever. When Jesus came to earth, he came... For a purpose. And when he died on the cross, he died for a purpose. And I believe that the surpassing purpose of Jesus coming and dying on the cross. Now this is against probably everything you've ever heard. But it was to bring glory to God the Father. And as you dig in a little bit further, the way God, he brings glory to God the Father is by bringing many sons and daughters in captivity behind him. In other words, he came to honor the Father, but he honors the Father as you and I respond to his gospel of peace and mercy and love and, 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 and forgiveness. And we honor God. And then Christ is the fullness of the Godhead. For in him all the fullness of God it was pleased to dwell. And Paul would amplify that all fullness kind of thought in chapter 2 verse 9 of our of our book for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and so the fullness of deity uh, of the deity of Christ was shown to us in the incarnation it's not enough to simply say Jesus is divine we've got to go beyond that and recognize that he possessed all of divinity in himself Divinity is an attribute of deity, and deity is the nature of God. And so as the fullness of God, Christ is the Lord of all light. So he's biblically preeminent. What does it mean to be preeminent? Surpassing all others. Okay? And he's spiritually preeminent. What does it mean to be preeminent? Okay. We're going to get it down. He's spiritually preeminent. And the key words summing up the spiritual preeminence of Jesus Christ are found in verses 20 through 22. In that the making peace by the blood of his cross and the body of flesh by his death. And so in his mighty sacrifice on the cross, God demonstrated through his perfect humanity that his life and death were offered up through the eternal spirit. The writer of the Hebrews put it this way in Hebrews 9, 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So what we find here is Christ was spiritually preeminent. Because in verses 21 and 22, going to dig in a little further, you who are once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Now you who are once alienated and hostile in mind and doing evil deeds, who's that? 
There you go. You got the me. One person in here is taking ownership. So who is it? It's all of us. Every single one of us. We all have to own. We all have to own our sin, misdeeds, and failures, right? I mean, if we're going to own the wins in life, we've got to own the failures in life, too. And so we've got to own it. And then it says, He has now reconciled in His body of flesh by His death. Why? In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before Him. His body of flesh, this is what it refers to. It refers to His history on planet Earth. We're not talking about His history prior to planet Earth, prior to the Incarnation, prior to the birth in Bethlehem. We're in, at this point talking about His history in those 33 years here on Earth. Okay? And, and, and so we read the Gospel and we see that in His body of flesh, He was preeminent. His walk was spiritual. Think about this. He was declared in Hebrews 7, 26, to be holy and innocent, unstained and separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. No one could challenge his character and his behavior. Now, he was holy, separated. He was innocent. You know, we're entering into the presidential political season. Nobody's saying, oh, I dread the political ads. Because you know what they do in this season? It doesn't matter, you know, where they stand politically. They all try to dig up dirt on each other and sling that dirt like crazy. What if they were to dig up dirt on you and I? Who would be willing to undergo such scrutiny as that? In the last service, they had one guy raise his hand. I'm thinking, man, you're crazy. Because, you know, we don't want them digging up dirt on us. We don't want it plastered out here how bad we've been and what we've done and who we've been associated and where we've gone and where we've spent and what we've bought. We don't want to do that. Right? So, you know, we're not, we're not willing, but Jesus is innocent. He's unstained. He's separated from people like you and I. No one could challenge the character of his behavior. And when he faced his critics, this is what he said, which one of you can convict me? You look at Jesus from every angle, there's no problem. His words are spiritual. People exclaimed and in the Gospel of uh, John, no one ever spoke like this man. In Luke, they marveled at his gracious words that came forth from his mouth. In Matthew, the Scripture says, When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority not like the scribes. Jesus wasn't teaching with, a, with a, a dead orthodoxy. He was teaching with a, a, magne, a magnetic communication. Now, what we're talking about this morning in, in the preeminence of Jesus Christ is orthodox. I mean, it's orthodox. It means that it's foundational for our Christian life. And we have to have orthodoxy, but it doesn't have to be dead. It can be alive. It can be flourishing. It can be radiant. It can be attractional. Jesus was attractional. And His works were spiritual. You know, those who witnessed His many miracles and all of His deeds, they said, He has done all things well. You know, if you looked at me, you couldn't say, I've done all things well. I look back at more than 30 years in the ministry, and, and I say, I have not done all all things well. There's things I would have done differently if I could go back and have re redos. But can I tell you, the life very seldom offers you the opportunity for a replay. That only happens in sports television. But the good side of it is, is this one who does all things well comes alongside us and picks us up 
and walks with us. There is a spiritual preeminence in his death. The scripture says in verse 20, he made peace by the blood of his cross. That, that blood of his cross speaks of, of, of his preeminence of his death in history. His death in history was the first time and the last time that Jesus Christ will ever die. And through that, he accomplished something. He accomplished redemption and forgiveness for you and for me. To be redeemed means that we've been bought bought back by God. You see, we've been sold out. We sold ourselves short. We believe the lie of the devil. We believe the lie of the world. We believe the, uh, the lie of our own ego. And we sold ourselves short. And in that selling of ourselves short, we were sinners. Separated from God. But Christ accomplished something in His death that no, person else, no other person could accomplish. He accomplished redemption. He paid the price to redeem us. And He accomplished something else that nobody else could accomplish. He accomplished forgiveness coming from the throne of God. And in that forgiveness, He brought about a God-made peace that none of us could come up with, and thereby we were reconciliated unto Him because of His cross, because of His death. And it's at the cross of Jesus Christ that heaven's love and heaven's justice meets. God loves His creation. You know, I love my kids. You love your kids. And in love, there's provision. In love, there's care. In love, there's watching over. In love, there's a freedom that allows them certain things. But every once in a while, justice has to meet that love. And so there's a punishment involved. Maybe they're grounded. Maybe they've got their social media taken away. No computer time alone. No telephone. No, no telephone. I mean, most of us grew up without pocket phones, you know. You can get by without those. Can't do that. And so justice meets love, right? And we carry out the punishment, and when we feel that enough has been punished... We give them back their phones or we take their grounding away or whatever else and they're, they're once again smiling. And when I look at what Jesus Christ did in redemption and in forgiveness, when I look at what He did uh, to remove my sin and to make a, a peace uh, through, uh, from the Father for me, to reconcile me, it all leads to a decision. It all leads to a decision and, and this is the most important decision that any one of us can ever make in our life. And it's the decision of whether or not Jesus Christ is going to be personally preeminent in my life. That He is going to surpass all other things. Maybe you're in college and you've got a sweet thing there you love. And He's about to ask you to marry Him. Well, maybe he's not such a sweet thing, but he's here as a handsome hunk. And you're the sweet thing. I don't know. For Jesus Christ to be preeminent, you've got to love Jesus more than him or her. Whoa, that's hard. That's really, really hard. That's, that's very difficult. Man, you've got those grandbabies. There's nobody as special as your grandbabies. You thought you were a mama bear with your kids? But when those grandbabies came along, you like an old grizzly. But for Christ to be preeminent above all other things, you've got to love Jesus more than your grandbabies. 
You've worked hard all your life. Home, career, all that stuff. You've got to love Jesus more than all that. You see, Jesus said, we've got to count the cost. He said, if anybody desires to come after me, if anybody desires to come after me, because understand that the, the road is, is broad and the gate is wide that leads to destruction, but the, the way is narrow and the gate is small that leads to eternal life. He said, if anybody desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Deny himself and take up his cross and follow after me, right? Man, if I'm going to deny myself, I've got to even love Jesus more than I love me. And I love me pretty well. Don't you love me pretty well? You're me. I mean, you look in the mirror in the morning and you say, good morning, me. Oh, you look good this morning, even if your hair is messed up. Oh, me, there's nobody quite like you. Now, you may not actually say that. You may not even consciously think that. But subconsciously, we live that out. We think the, the, the universe re revolves around me. You know how I know that, even in the church? You know how I know church people think that the universe revolves around them? Because of silly phone calls that we get. And it's not fully silly, but I just want to exaggerate something. Someone calls and says, what kind of worship do you all have? Now, the ministry assistants are much kinder and more gracious than the pastor. Oh, we do a blend. We have old and young and everything in between, and we would love to have you. I just want to say, well, we worship God, right? Right? But really, let's dig deeper. Really, what is, what is the essence of that question? What kind of worship do you have? In other words, do you sing when the roll is called up yonder? I'll be there. And all those old hymns. Because that's worship to me. And that's what I like. Or, or then, or do y'all sing those songs like, if you're an ocean, I want to jump in it. If you're a grenade, I want to pull the pin. Where'd they go? Here I am giving them free advertisement. And, and what happens if we get... I'm, hey, I'm, we got camera operators. You're following me. Okay. When we're, when we're asking that kind of a question... We're saying, well, you know, I like this and I like that. Let me tell you something right up front. There's no such thing as, you're going to get angry, it's Christian music. There's Christian lyrics, but there is not Christian music. Okay, following with me? If you can shake your head, no, but you're wrong. God created everything, right? And the real point of worship is not what I like. Uh-oh, we're going to step on a toe right now. It's not what I like. The real point of worship, if Christ is preeminent, surpassing above all other things, is what God likes. Uh-oh. And what does God like? He must like a variety because there's a variety. But what he wants is he wants us to come to him with a purity of heart. He wants, to come, he wants us to come to him with a, a fidelity of mind, a faithfulness. He wants us to come to him with a love that surpasses all others and says, Lord, I love you, I love you, I love you. Because, Lord Jesus, you've got the first spot. You've got the first place in my life. And the problem that we face is there are times in our life when it's just like that. Jesus is first, 
right? Hello? But what happens? Other things get mixed in, right? Back before Beverly asked me to marry her, I was praying. I mean, you know, I knew God had called me to preach. That was the singular most important thing in my life in serving Him. And I remember praying for a wife that could handle that. Man, that's a big decision. Real big decision. So we get married, and Christ is good, and Beverly's good, and kids come along, churches come along, and sometimes we just kind of forget that Christ is first. He's first above our spouse. He's first above our children. He's even first above our church. He is to have Preeminence. Preeminence. You know, we can all accept that. No problem. But acceptance to acknowledgement is a big step. If I'm going to acknowledge it, it means that I... As a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm going to bow fresh again at the cross. But you know, that's really the living secret. That these four Sundays have been about, they're leading us to the next eight weeks. It's about bowing at the cross. It's about submitting everything at the foot of the cross and lifting Jesus up of surpassing value above all things. Above all things. You know, as a pastor, I've done a lot of weddings. Man, everybody's happy. They're having fun. Done a lot of funerals, too. Even for the godliest saint, there's a certain sadness. It's in the room. It's a loss on our, ha- on our behalf. I've even helped carry the caskets and put them in the hearse. When I was a pastor up in the mountains, uh, I remember me and one old deacon pouring down rain. Funeral man, we carried a casket down the side of the hill in the slippery red mud and put it into the ground by ourselves. I did one funeral, I'll never forget this one up in the mountains, and it was crazy. I uh, learned to model funeral messages after a pastor by the name of Nelson Price, who was pastor of the Roswell Street Baptist Church in Marietta, Georgia, for many, many years. And I'd been asked to do a funeral up in the mountains this particular day with four other preachers, because mountain folks are a little different, right? So the other three preachers all did their thing, and I got up and, okay, Lord, I'm going to wrap it up. We've, we've cried and we've moaned, and I mean, we've been in a lot of places, and I wrapped it up and talked about the hope of the glory of Christ Jesus. As I say the final amen, one of those preachers jumped and landed on top of the casket, just sprawled out. Oh, Lord, please don't take her. Honest. I'll never forget it. You know, I should have been writing this down in a book a long time ago. (laughs) But I've never seen God bring somebody back to us. I've only seen them go. And I've, I've buried poor men, and I've buried rich men. And I have yet to see the u haul following the hearst to put all their wealth and all their riches in the ground with them so they can have it on the other side. The Bible says we came naked into this world, 
and we're going to leave the same way. But here's the big question. Between accepting that Jesus is to be a, a preeminent is to acknowledge that fact in my life. It brings us to a place of judgment ourselves. The Spirit comes to convict the world. Convict means to convince us of sin. How many of you know that you're a sinner? You know, we all know that we sin. And righteousness... That to be convicted of righteousness means that we recognize that Jesus Christ is God's righteous Son. There's nothing in Him whatsoever of any fault. That He is righteousness, but it's also convinced that He is our righteousness. Well, how do you get convinced of that? It says the Holy Spirit Himself works in your life and calls you to the Savior. There's an old song we sing sometimes, it's called The Savior's Waiting to Enter Your Heart. Oh, won't you let Him to come in? And, 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 you know, I think that when we sense that the Spirit's working in our heart, it's at that moment that we ought to respond and acknowledge the Savior. Because, you see, the Spirit also convinces us of judgment. If we're convicted that Jesus Christ is our righteousness, we're also convicted that He took our judgment on the cross. He took that judgment for me. He took what was required for my sin for me. But if I don't acknowledge that, that judgment's still on me. And God says, if I pass into eternity, it doesn't matter how much wealth I've got, or if I pedal the village on a bicycle with two Walmart bags on Sunday. And we've got a couple of folks like that. If I don't come to the place where I have acknowledged Christ, that judgment's on me. And when I go into eternity, God says you'll be separated from me forever and ever in a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's no do-overs. A place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched and the thirst is not quenched. A place of fire and brimstone, a place called hell. You see, it's important that we come to the knowledge of that truth because that's the most important acknowledgement that we can ever make. So I want to ask you something this morning as I wrap it up. Does Christ Jesus have the preeminent place in your life? As a follower of Christ, you might need to bow your head and say, Oh, Lord Jesus, I lay these things aside to exalt you as my king once again. I do it every day. Every day! But if you've never come to know Jesus Christ, I urge you to respond to the gospel, the good news that He has come. Accept it and acknowledge. Would you come this morning? Would you say, Pastor, I'm trusting Christ? Or, Pastor, in exalting Christ in my life, I know I'm supposed to be a part of this church family and I want to unite with it. Or, there's something else I need to do. Would you do that today? Oh, Holy Spirit, we bow here this morning. We ask you to move in this place. We ask for your power to be prevalent and poured out. We ask you to help us come to a place where we are all together lifting up Jesus Christ as surpassing all other things in our lives. Lord, to you be the glory, both now and in your church, and throughout all the generations. In Jesus we pray, amen.